Goedenavond en van harte welkom, dames en heren. We zijn erg, erg blij dat we deze uitzonderlijke avond, ondanks de moeilijke situatie, toch kunnen presenteren. Ik wil het Kai Theater hartelijk danken voor de gastvrijheid. Zonder Kai Theater hadden we jullie niet zo talrijk en in veilige omstandigheden kunnen ontvangen. Ik dank ook de uitgeverijen L'Olivier en L'Iconoclast, die bereid waren om onze partner voor vanavond te zijn. We zijn zeer vereerd dat we vanavond de Brits-Canadese schrijfster Rachel Kusk mogen verwelkomen. Verwelkomen, sorry. De auteur van mijn scherpe romans en essay, een fervente feminist, vertelt ons zo meteen over haar briljante werk dat zich niet makkelijk in vacuus laat stoppen. Born in Canada to English parents, Rachel Kusk broke onto the international scene in 1993 with her first novel, Saving Agnes, which was immediately awarded the White Bread Prize. She is the author of a dozen novels and three works of non-fiction and, and been shortlisted for numerous prizes. The Outline Trilogy, which Kusk began in 2014, marks a break in her work. Outline, Transit, and Kudos draw a very subtle portrait of a woman passing through books like a shadow. A singular and fascinating literary experience for which Kusk has been compared to Virginia Woolf. In 2019, her candid essays on gender, politics, and literature were collected in Coventry. Her new novel, Second Place, was nominated for the 2021 Booker Prize. Alongside her works of fiction, Rachel Kusk has built up an autobiographical body of work, including an uncompromising text on her divorce, aftermath on marriage and separation. An avowed feminist, she sparked off a fierce controversy in 2001 when she published an essay on her experience of motherhood, a life's work on becoming a mother. A trenchant and shockingly sincere book. 20 years after its, its first publication, the book, finally translated in French, aux éditions de l'Olivier, now seems to have found a more welcoming climate for the taboos that it broke in such a hilarious and sharp manner. Why has motherhood been so disregarded in literature until now? And how did Kusk use her experience of this most important issue to make a literary statement? Mais c'est une double affiche que nous avons ce soir puisque le deuxième micro sera entre les mains de Julia Kerninon. Romancière française, Julia Kerninon a publié une dizaine de livres dont Buvard, Le dernier amour d'Attila Kiss, Ma dévotion ou Liv Maria. Docteur en littérature américaine, elle a consacré sa thèse aux interviews d'écrivains, une thèse publiée dans une version simplifiée aux presses universitaires de France sous le titre « Le chaos ne produit pas de chef dœuvre » et qui se penche sur la fabrication du mythe de l'écrivain chez John Steinbeck, Ernest Hemingway et William Faulkner et qui se lit précisément comme un roman. Julia Kerninon est également anglophile, traductrice de l'anglais, et outre les interviews d'écrivains, il est une autre ligne, une autre interrogation qui traverse, qui transperce son travail, c'est celle de la maternité. Ses romans, mais aussi ses traductions, puisqu'elle euh, est notamment l'autrice d'une traduction de Selfish, Shallow and self Aboard, un essai paru en français sous le titre « Ils vécurent heureux et n'eurent pas d'enfants », un livre courageux, percutant et très nuancé dans lequel 16 écrivains expliquent pourquoi ils ont pris la décision de ne pas avoir d'enfants et auquel Julia Kerninon offre une préface intime assez bouleversante. Et puisqu'il n'y a pas de coïncidence, en cette rentrée de janvier, Julia Kerninon vient juste de faire paraître « Toucher la terre ferme » aux éditions de l'Iconoclaste. C'est un essai personnel incandescent qui examine ce qu'avoir des enfants a changé dans sa vie de femme et surtout d'écrivain. C'est un livre galopant, un autoportrait incroyablement vivant, vibrant, et qui se trouve tendre un miroir contemporain 
passionnant au Life's Work de Rachel Kusk. Mais il sera question de beaucoup d'autres sujets que celui de la maternité ce soir. Euh, en tout cas, voilà autant d'arguments qui nous ont donné très envie à Passaporta de demander à Julia Carminon d'être l'interlocutrice assez exceptionnelle de Rachel Kusk ce soir. Je voudrais vraiment la remercier d'avoir accepté ce rôle quelque peu inhabituel. After the meeting, Rachel Kusk and Julia Carninon will be available to sign uh, books in French, in English and in the Netherlands. Before we begin, could you uh, please check that your phones are on silent mode and I wish you a very pleasant evening. Thank you. This is intimidating. <laughs> uh, hi, Rachel. Hello. Hi. I'm going to do my best. Um, <coughs> I thought I'd start with the trilogy. Um, so in your novels, Outline, Transit, and Kudos, you follow Faye, a divorced writer with two sons. In Outline, she travels to Athens for workshop in transit, she's just dealing with real estate questions and renovating a London townhouse. And in Kudos, she attends a literary festival somewhere in Europe. Apart from that, we know very little about Faye because the books are mostly about what people tell her. She meets various people, some strangers, some old friends, and she listens to them and observes them. Um, what I was thinking of is maybe you're familiar with Ernest Hemingway approach, uh, ap apocryphal qualification of his own approach of autobiography and memoir. According to Mary Hemingway's last wife, he described what he was doing in a movable feast as biography by remate. You heard that? Mm -hmm. um, remate comes from the Spanish rematar, which means re-kill, and means a two-world shot in Jai Alai, a sort of squash game. If I'm right, as I'm not too sporty myself. Mary Hemingway told the New, New Times Book Review that what he meant by that was that he was telling his life by reflection, possibly through the portrait of others, such as Gertrude Stein, Ezra Pound, and Scott Fitzgerald. It seems actually that Mary Hemingway's Spanish was not too good and that she might not have gotten it too right. But if the legend is better, then print the legend. And I thought again of this story while reading this trilogy, because you too seem to make the portrait of Faye through the others. So. Can you please comment on this and maybe tell us how you came to this idea for the structure of choosing a narrator that's that telling about others rather than herself? Hello, everybody. Um, sorry to be speaking in English and sorry to make you speak in English. Um, so, it, I mean, it's strange for me that um, this book, A Life's Work, has, that I'm talking about it now, I guess, because it, it not only is it uh, 21 years old, but uh, the, the beings that it describes are also <laughs> 21 years old. So um, it feels like a, a, a kind of remote landscape. But in fact, you know, thinking about your question, um, I think that what I realized in that book was that um, the, f the forms of female existence um, couldn't, there were no literary forms for them. There were no literary forms for this kind of writing and, and that, that I suppose to deal with this experience I had to uh, split <laughs> my idea of literary form in two and, and um, write a memoir or, you know, that was the kind of available word for it then. I mean, I think now ways of writing about the self have, have rightly become more nuanced and more complex. But at the time, memoir was the big <laughs> vague category that, that, you know, anything that, that wasn't pretending to be something else could be put in. And, and um, I guess by the time 20 years later, I got 
to the trilogy, um, that feeling of having to um, use self, having to use identity. Ha and even though I tried to use it in a way that was as almost impersonal and universal and non-subjective, not about me, not about my specific baby, but about a baby, not about me specifically as a mother, but a mother. You know, I really tried to to pare away as much subjectivity from it as I could. Um, but it's still, you know, in a sense, myself was the only thing I had to sell in, in you know, the only property I had to write about these areas of, of womanhood. And, and um, the feeling suddenly thinking about writing the trilogy that that, that actually I had defined <laughs> a whole, all these sort of territories kind of around, sort of with a, a bit missing in the middle, um, and, and that actually I could, could inhabit that middle bit and uh, look at the world from a, um, a different basis of, of identity, I guess, of almost a, a feeling of non-being um, rather than the being that, that had had to guarantee, you know, everything else that I'd written. It's extremely interesting, but I have to go slowly. <laughs> uh, then would you say that maybe the form of the memoir would seemed at that time to be the right one for you because it uh, guaranteed you a sort of legitimacy because when you, it's hard to speak about motherhood if you don't speak as a mother isn't it? Or would you have felt that you, it was possible to write a novel about mother if you were not a mother yourself? Well, I think the areas that I was interested in, you know, it was this feeling that every time um, one arrived at a, a, a kind of um, central experience of womanhood uh, that, that is absolutely part of, you know, a socially constructed experience that is also a personal experience. Um, that there was this feeling that that uh, not that not that people necessarily lied <laughs> or, or you know misled um, one another about the nature of these experiences, but there was a lot of fog around them, and and I think particularly motherhood, there is a great. Um, pressure on the individual in that experience that you know the whole there is a huge social moral and emotional weight that bears down on a woman at that moment and you know what what um, it, that doesn't seem an occasion uh, for you know the first thing a woman in that position is going to think is that, she, that she's made a mistake there's something wrong with her she's done something wrong rather than uh, to, to interrogate how that experience has been represented. Um, so I think that, that you know, it really felt like that saying I <laughs> was the most essential thing um, because saying anything else really is, is to, to um, almost create, I don't know, a, a more fog ar around the subject, um, that there are some experiences that are so challenging personally, <laughs> that to talk about them in any way other than personally uh, is, is really to betray what that experience actually was. I have a confession to make, is that I read Life's work years ago before I had kids myself. And because I'm a writer and because everything in my life has been structured by literature, the books that I've read more than the books that I've written, obviously, when I was thinking about having kids for the first time, I was searching for books where actually women writers would speak about what it was like. So I read your books and at that time I didn't like it very much because it <laughs> makes me really uncomfortable and you know there was something that had to do with the, um, the proud of the non-parents that think that he would do better, better, that he would, you know that. I well, think it says it in the book. There's yeah, a passage yeah, yeah. in the book totally that says that, exactly that. That's that. why I dare yeah. to tell you that. And so I, I've reread the book recently to prepare for this. And I, I find it brilliant and it makes me laugh a lot. And I felt that what happened in the meantime, obviously, is that I gave birth to two sons. And now I can hear you 
like it feels like now that I've crossed that river and join you on the shore, I can hear your message, but it is too late to turn around now. Whatever serious lesson that you've given me and all the people in that book, I could only hear it now that it's too late. And we will have to stay on this shore forever, you and I, obviously. Um, but what you said just before, I really often think about the fact that literature has been made mostly by men, because what do the sh short story that we were not allowed to go to school for centuries, <laughs> obviously. And so what you say about the difficulty to um, speak about women topics in literature is that, yeah, we have no given form for that. So actually, are you saying that you had to invent a new form to speak about women mm, problems, topics, um, um, subjects, questions? I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure I invented anything, but, but I certainly um, sacrificed something. And, you know, the decision to write about this subject, you know, I, before I wrote this book, I published three novels. I, I was a literary novelist. Um, and there was a, a clear, um, even before the book came out, a clear attitude <laughs> uh, from, you know, the... the people in my working world that, that essentially this was a subject that was beneath literature and that to write about it was really to um, hand in your or surrender your intellectual credentials um, and what was very um, I suppose I mean unfair in a way but but uh, you know what what made the situation kind of a, a sort of checkmate or catch-22 for me was that when the book came out, there was another group of people who were women who felt that um, by intellectualizing <laughs> motherhood, I had betrayed something uh, or, or made um, something of it that that, um, that they repudiated and, and indeed that, that, I mean, it was said to me, how, how could I possibly consider myself to be a good mother if I had the time <laughs> and the energy to uh, write something like that and to, you know, craft something of, of literary value. So, so in a sense, the book um, had no home. It had no uh, place in culture. And, you know, when you create something, um, you know, I would like to think that, you know, I never think about needing to place something in culture, needing there to be already a, a, a space or category for, you know, where what I have to say is known. I would like to write something that is unknown. And, but it did the experience of, of this book floating in, the <laughs> in this sort of homeless way, um, very attacked uh, as well. Um, and then I suppose I began to hear from um, actual readers and began to see how it, it did something, and okay, for the, the reader who hasn't had children and, and um, you know, that, that I guess gets to the very, very heart of what I'm trying to do in this book, which is um, ask the question of whether there are certain experiences that are incommunicable, uh, that, that you cannot, you have to experience them to know them. You cannot know them without experiencing them. Nobody can, uh, I suppose, create a representation of those things that is in any way equal to, to the thing itself. Um, and, and so that, again, is a reason to have a book, <laughs> to, as something you can say, oh, I've, I've changed. The book is still the same, and I've, I've changed. But that's funny, because I, I started my question with uh, the form of the trilogy and how you, I felt like you invented something. And actually, what you're coming back to is that the topic of your book about motherhood was in itself something that could not find it, its place in literature. So it makes me wonder, yeah, if it has something to do with the fact that literature has been so massively masculine, so that even we as women, like we we have this way of being women, so most of us maybe, we experience the things of motherhood and giving birth and, I don't know, living with men, all this. and. Even to us, maybe, it doesn't appear as literary subject. 
and still with your books 20 years ago, you sort of opened a breach in that saying, I am trying, I am doing a book about this. And so I'm somehow trying to give a place for it in literature. So you just, you know, dig a hole somewhere where maybe others could also dig afterwards. And have you think about it in this way? Did, did you feel like you were a pioneer or? Um, I don't know how a pioneer feels, but I imagine they feel very alone, very cold, very tired, <laughs> and not very supported. Um, so yes, perhaps I, I did feel like that. And um, <laughs> I mean, I think that the, you know, there's an essential, uh, and one doesn't think too much about, you know, it's only alf afterwards that you look back and, and see what it is you've done and take a view on, on what that is. Um, it certainly seemed to me that, that uh, the, uh, it wasn't a responsibility or a, a duty exactly, but, but for whatever reason, my impulse was um, to, I guess the feeling was, was it wasn't even sort of saying the unsayable or, or you know, which is somehow how this book is, is treated. It, it uh, was doing justice to things that, to my own sense of truth, a and that, in the end, is all you have. You know, as any kind of artist, um, you, you have the possibility of, of serving your own sense of truth, and you have the possibility of turning away from that and th and thinking about yourself in in culture or yourself as a producer of of cultural products in a, in a completely different way. And uh, and I think that was all I did was um, believe that that my job <laughs> was to serve this this thing that was in in front of me and um you know the feeling of you know perhaps one of the reasons why i i experience pleasure in in writing um is because i have this feeling of breaking ground and when i don't have that feeling i don't want to write i don't it doesn't, there doesn't seem any point to me. Um, so, w I mean, all of which is to say that I never see the trouble <laughs> when it's coming. Um, I'm always surprised that, that people are upset by the things that, that I write. Um, because for me, it's, a, it's such a simple, kind of honest process. Um, yeah, I definitely do connect with that. I've read that in my last book, like uh, my books are not there to show my sense of morality they are there to show what I've seen and I'm trying to just... But did you realize, because you wrote, if I'm right, you wrote three novels before you did that uh, memoir, autobiography writing, if I can. And I also read what you said about like when you write your first novel, you feel like you, you connected to something that felt really true to you and that's why I, I think you kept on writing and then you said something about being a little, not disappointed, but troubled by your own second books, like you felt like second novel, that you felt like you had somehow not touched exactly what you wanted to touch with that. And, and, and you say something about like doing a book is when you really, yeah, connect with something really true to you and that you somehow missed it with the second one and just quoting uh, you vaguely, but did you realize when after three novels you moved on to that books of autobiography writing what you were doing, like, I don't know, symbolically speaking, you were suddenly, um, you know, crossing the border of fiction to something else? Did you no, realize? I, d I definitely didn't, yeah. and um, but what I recall is, is very clearly is the feeling, and I do wonder, what would have become of me if I had, <laughs> if I had stayed where I was? But the feeling of, um, I mean, I was a young writer. You know, I was very young, 23 or something, when I wrote my first book. And um, but the feeling of not knowing where that book had come from, and not knowing where another one would ever come from, and uh, not really understanding um, what this. Uh, visitation <laughs> was, or, or um, and I mean, you, you talked earlier about um, culture being essentially a masculine um, well. 
yeah, I mean, so, you know, a uh, series of monuments and, and um, you know, that is where we come from too. Uh, you know, I have the books, that I, the canon that I love, the books that I've read, um, you know, I come from, from those fathers as well as <laughs> a few mothers. Um, and uh, I think that that, if I really think about it, that this feeling of being mystified by, um, or there being an, an area of, of almost kind of blindness or, or um, in, in this, this kind of receiving of, of inspiration or call it what you will, of an idea and, and a vision of, of what I might do with that idea. I think that that, that disconnect probably is um, to do with, with us being the daughters of, <laughs> of an essentially male culture. And so what I felt with this book was, um, I don't think I was even conscious of it, but, but a feeling of maybe being suddenly for the first time kind of on my native shore and writing something that did not have those antecedents that I was not dressing up and, <laughs> and talking the literary language that actually I, it was not really my nationality. And, and um, so that feeling of, of um, not a home exactly, but an entitlement. Or to mother tongue. Yeah, but I felt entitled to be there. Uh, I felt that I was, that was a legitimate place for me to be. And maybe in, in my um, version of novel writing before that, I felt like an imposter possibly, um, or at least was borrowing, um, you know, a, a, a not just a language, a sen you know, a set of sentences, a, a way of perceiving the world that, that actually I'd been given by some <laughs> strange process. So, and, and I mean, that has taken a long, long, long time for me, you know, to resolve that separation that I think is um, not, you know, it's not just a, a separation that, that a, a, an artist or writer, a woman artist or writer would experience. It's, it's absolutely central to the, f the female experience of, of being alive now, um, that, that it, it, is, it remains a radical condition. Um, femininity remains a radical condition. And would you say that, because um, from what I've read, you've always been writing as a kid, and then when you were, I don't know, maybe I'm gonna be wrong, 20, 21, 23, you decided to take some time to write your novel, so you isolated yourself, and write this, and you, you, I don't know, I think I have somewhere the quotation, but you, you, you speak about, yeah, just taking it very seriously and trying to learn how to write and everything. And I think I would like you to comment on that some, some time. But also, um, were you able to picture yourself when you were that young as becoming possibly a writer when, as you say, all the writers that we love because they are the writers that we know, actually the classics. When you, when you ask what's a good book, what's a classic, you always end up with a, most often with a, with a book written by a man. I'm asking uh, because that was one of my central questions myself when I was trying to become a writer as I was this very um, um, wise girl growing up not in Paris and everything. I wanted to be a writer more than anything, but then I thought, you, you cannot be a writer because you're a girl. This is not possible, and it was very hard to find a role model to teach me how to do that. So did you also um, have to find uh, your way with that? Is that? How did you picture yourself as a writer? How did you give you permission to be a writer when you were a woman? Um, I think I thought that writers were all dead. <laughs> 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 I don't think I knew that you could be a writer. Mm -hmm. I definitely didn't know that. Um, I didn't know that living people did that. Um. <laughs> but that, that, that's very fun because you, you did it um, earlier than most people actually because I've read that sentence somewhere that I find like brilliant. You say, yeah, it was weird to be in my late 20s and being a writer, professional writer and having my own house in London. And I could picture you and I was like, yeah, it sounds like a dream life. But also I could 
sense, how it could be confusing to suddenly um, arrive at that place also of success, because success and, and failure are parts of, you know, writing life, obviously. And so how did you feel when you were, you know, a professional writer and, I don't know, how, how did you picture it to yourself being there? Um, I don't think I've ever accepted that identity. Um, I don't think I've ever thought that it matters whether you're a writer or not. Um, I, I don't, I never felt like I was joining a club or um, no, not a club, doing something that had anything to do with me. Um, it's, it, it feels, it still feels to me like um, an ability that, that, and I mean, I'm sure, you know, I'm absolutely not alone in saying this and, and possibly many people feel this about lots of other things in life that, that you know, you have an ability and, and yourself is much more flawed than that and fails <laughs> to, to, to know what that, the person who has that ability knows. And I mean, one of the things in the novel I just uh, brought out, Second Place, um, that's one of the central questions of that book is how, how does an artist know what is this <laughs> artistic knowledge that, that you can know something as an artist that you absolutely don't know as a human that you, you, you are completely unaware of? And, and um, you know, that idea of, of um, a gift or a, a talent is something that, that really interests me, um, that I don't see as... Uh, a particularly wonderful <laughs> or positive thing, but as as actually a, 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 a visceral struggle with the whole concept of identity. Um, and, and when once you get into an area where, and and there are many of these areas where identity is is an absolutely fundamental moral position that has got to be defended. Um, how that because I think. Creativity is amoral, and, and it probably actually doesn't have any identity at all. And essentially, you know, what we've been talking about of, of having a, an identity that's, um, I mean, I think I des described it somewhere as being almost a kind of transvestite um, <laughs> aspect of femininity where, where you're receiving male values and sort of walking around with male values and then kind of having to, to speak as a woman. Um, you know, those, that, conflict is is um you know in the end i don't know what this talent this that people have this ability to to um to utter and and give expression to themselves um how much it owes to identity um mm. you, you know i could have I guess, uh, completely ignored the fact that I was a woman and gone off and, and written about a lot of other things and I think I would have had a far easier life if, <laughs> <laughs> if I'd done that. Um, for whatever reason, I, I knew that those two things had to fight it out in, in my case and I think probably in the case of, of um, anybody who, whose identity is, is either still evolving or is uh, disempowered or, or in question, um, it's more important than ever to, to k hold your grip on um, the reality of the self and of lived experience. And, and those two things fight it out to the death as far as I'm concerned. I've seen you respond to a question in an interview with someone ask you what was more important to become an artist or writer and it was it was asking you to choose between talent and work and you seem to be thinking a lot and then you say I think just stop me if I'm wrong but it, it was incredible for me to hear that you said I think that the most important thing is desire desire is something that we usually describe as being secondary. Like everybody speaks about the needs. Uh, I, it's like Beckett's, you know, uh, I'm no good to do anything else. And I'm always a bit scared when people, artists, when they describe their artistic practice as something that they need to do, 
when I think that what we desire to do is much more telling about who we are, and also it put us much more at risk, mm. and it risk that interested us, probably. And so I really just blew my mind when I heard you say that. And I thought that the girl that you were when you started to write must have been fooled with some sort of desire. What were you trying to do then when you were alone and doing your first book? And you know, I, I don't know, I do believe that there's a huge difference between the first book we write and all the others afterwards. Because the first one we write, we do it outside of the public eye. And even though we somehow desire the public eye because we write book in order to get published, because that's what book is supposed to be, to say it simple. We desire to be published, and once we are, we can never go back. And somehow this looks a lot like motherhood. Mm. And, you know, and then you will never be able to write in the same anonymity, but also in the same silence when you mm. don't know what people think about what you're doing, what you've done. Mm. So how was it for you that w what, what kept you writing that first book? And how was it when suddenly you started to have a public persona after mm. that? That's interesting. Um, that's a good description of um, the w what it is to create things without any sense of, of um, them being, I suppose, taken away from you and <laughs> and having having their own life in the world. And and in a way, it's a kind of innocence. Actually, um, I think that um, I mean I've met you know many writers um, in my uh, writerly career and I'm really aware that, that many of them started much further down the road than I did, <laughs> possibly because they had had more enlightened childhoods. Um, they, they had begun somewhere higher up the mountain and, and I began right at the bottom. And so I think that um, my first experiences of creativity were um, a huge, uh, almost like dismantling of what had happened to me and who I appeared to be or who my family said I was or who, you know, essentially a ridding myself of um, all of that. Uh, I guess misleading um, and very cumbersome um, information. Uh, I think that there's a, I mean, I'm a strong subscriber to the um, view that, that artists are people who've never left childhood or whose, whose attachment to, <laughs> whose childlikeness was never actually disrupted or, you know, either because they didn't work things out or they didn't, what they wanted weren't the things that other people wanted that, that caused them to, to suddenly enter the adult world. And, and um, so I think that that strong um, desire to uh, essentially release <laughs> or, or sort of chip away at, at what was um, surrounding this, this particular self was a, a, a very strong motivating factor it, it felt uh, like th that if I if I got the um, right relationship to myself um, an, an awful lot of other things would come from that but I don't think I thought an awful lot of other books would come from that I don't, I don't think that was um, I recently discovered idea. myself that I had never thought about that before which just surprised me afterwards but both my parents were teachers, and my grandparents as well. And I just recently found out that probably the main reason why I, I choose very early to become a writer is that because I wanted to have authority. Because a house full of teachers mm -hmm. is a house where everybody's trying to have authority on you. And I think I've been through that again when I had my kids, and my parents wanted to teach me how to be a mother. It was like, <laughs> just stop it now. So have you think about that, that you that maybe you became an author, maybe you also, to 
regain authority on your own life, person, personality, life afterwards? Was it a way to have control, but also wilderness mm. to get out of the, um, you know? Well, I mean, I think that the job and impulse of any artist has got to be to break the version break the version of life that everyone says, that everyone subscribes to. Everyone says, yes, it's like this. And you have to think, no, it's not. Because I think actually a lot of people think, no, it's not. And they think, oh, well, <laughs> they say it is. I know it's not, but, but we'll just go along in this, in this sort of half. You know, I think many, many, many people um, at different points in life feel a pressing need to, to know what the truth is. And there's this idea that that's what art is, that art is the place where people say what the truth is. And I mean, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. But, um, but I, th I certainly think that the impulse to create is very, very close to, um, to that. I suppose it's a desire, not, not even a desire, but a, um, an impulse to correct the drift off into uh, subjective versions of how things are, stories, um, exaggerations, uh, mislaying of detail, um, and you know, any child um, growing up in a family hears that happening around them all the time, and, and um, you know, you go somewhere with your parent and you both witness an event and you go home and your parent describes that event and you possibly think that isn't what happened, and um, you know, those were my formative experiences was thinking that and um, yeah so I think that that was a, a, a strong um, beginning for me um. and how would you you yourself personally would like to describe the difference that exists between fiction and reality because you've written fiction also written autobiographical writings and then in the trilogy, you're, you seem to just transcribe um, mundane conversations, but then obviously that's not what you're doing. You're doing something else. But you're sort of toying with what is fiction and what is reality. And not in that sort of troubling way that can be autofiction, like your, because I could ask you what in the trilogy is real, what have you, heard in the trains or what people have confessed to you, but unless you want to comment on that, I don't think that's the point. But yeah, how would you describe the difference between fiction and reality? What is it to you, one and the other? Well, I mean, I like to think that the, the greatest experiences of reality are had in, in uh, experiencing art, and that certainly for me, um, the, the times when I read something that manages to represent something so intangible in living that I would not even have known that, that it had happened to me had I not seen it represented right there in front of me by a writer or a painter or, you know, to me that those are the deepest experiences of reality. That reflection, <laughs> the recognition of that reflection. And, and um, I mean, what can our experience of reality ever be except um, a series of reflections that we have um, a, a, such a, a, an amazing illusion of, of control over, of, you know, us being us and seeing what is not us and, um, you know, any trauma, um, the first thing that happens is that that belief in reality begins to break down. Um, you suddenly start to see through it. You suddenly see it's just that you <laughs> believed in, in various relationships, believed that, you know, this is how, I don't know, your, your town or village acts. This is how your country acts. This is how the people in your life act. Th these are the things that, that are real. And, and um, you know, that, I mean, some of the memoir writing that I did after her life's work, I mean, particularly Aftermath, was very concerned with, with 
marriage as a <laughs> whole lifelong belief state um, that, that uh, yeah, that once it, it begins to break down, um, the, the questions of, of about reality are, are um, absolutely overwhelming. Um, so, so I guess that's been my interest. Um, and particularly, I mean, to, you know, I've been talking a bit about a life's work lately, obviously, because it's just come out in, in France. And, um, it, yeah, it's kind of interesting that, that the fact that I wrote it um, not when I had my first child, but when I had my second child, because when I ha had my second child, only then did I realize I had entirely forgotten the whole, all of these uh, intangible, mysterious, <laughs> but very, very, very real um, aspects of, of that experience. It had all gone. And I mean, I'm sure there's perfectly good biological reasons why a woman's mind is wiped clean like a slate. <laughs> um, but, but, but indeed, that had happened. And, and um, you know, so I think once something like that has, has once you've seen that, um, the desire to, to be the chronicler of that underworld, of that other world, um, that, that, that is not directed by personality, you know, that it, and that is directed to a degree by biological fate, by geographical fate, by racial fate, by, you know, how, whatever form and shape you're put on this earth, um, you know, is that the thing you're going to believe in? Is that what, what you're going to believe you are? Um, and anybody who manages to create some distance between their, their actual self that has no identity and this set of facts um, has, I suppose, for me, a, a maybe deeper relationship with, with reality. And um, you say that, not here, but other, other word, you say that you, you say that because of motherhood, as from what I've understood, motherhood forces you to deform what would have been your natural way of working. And you say that you usually um, spend a lot of time not writing, not working, just thinking and living what you call a normal life, which I believe it is, and, and, and just thinking your whole book until you have it almost whole or even whole in your head. And then you sit and you write it in what is relatively a very short time compared to the time that you think about it. You correct me if I'm saying anything wrong, right? And um, What are the sort of things that you would not put in your fiction work because you would think that it is too mundane, too not f fictional enough? And also, what would you not put in autobiographical work? Because, you know, when you, I, I do think, and I think I'm not the only one, when you write autobiographical writing, you always have to manage the balance between what interests you, what might interest other people, and more than that, actually, how do you manage your own fiction? Because we know that every time we speak, we are making fiction, actually. We're just telling our own ver version of what happens. I've had this discussion with uh, ha, Freudian people, and I thought I've was about to kill them over a bottle of wine because I saw that <laughs> I said that I've written autobiography and they said no you had you have written fiction I was like ah this is autobiography <laughs> you get that they enjoy annoying people yeah, they're shrinks yeah. they're like it's all fiction I was like it's not fiction fiction means something and so this is this is tricky when you write autobiography how are you sure that you're not fictionalizing things too much and when you write fiction how do you manage not to put in it things that are just straight from reality? Mm. 
you know? Because the books are different. The books you've written, even though we don't care about labels, they are different books and they are labeled differently. And I believe you've choose how they were going to be presented. So what is it that you take out of your fiction books because you think it's too real? And what is it that you take off of your autobiographical writing because you think it's too fictional? Is it? Um, what is your limit? What is your criteria? I think I use a really similar process for both things, even though they are, as you say, different things. And to me, it's much, much more important to be very careful in autobiography, um, not to use personal material. So, which might seem like a contradiction <laughs> in terms, but that, that has very much been my process. Um, I mean, just to give an example, um, so in my childhood and youth, I was sent to a, um, a harsh Catholic convent boarding school, so that was my schooling for years, and, and uh, it was an unhappy experience. And, well, you know, I've often been asked, why, do, why haven't you written about it? And I think I would never write about that, because that doesn't happen to most people. That's not something that other people, I mean, it happens to some people, and I guess there's a way of writing about it that at best you could set up a correspondence with other people's experiences of, I don't know, being confined, having their, <laughs> you know, being in some institution with their liberty restricted where they don't want to be and where they're separated from love and other things. Um, that would be the best you could do. Anything other than that is just anecdotal. You're just telling stories about what happened to you. And, um, you know, I certainly do use what happened to me because that is uh, all, all I have. I mean, that is the only evidence of reality and truth that I have. And so it, it's important to um, stay very, very close uh, to, to what you know. But, I mean, it really is. And... Um, I used, to, I used to have, uh, I mean, anyone who teaches creative writing, which I did for many years, um, you, when you meet the creative writing student, you're meeting someone who holds the very, very opposite view of the view I've just expressed and who has been told their whole life that writing involves um, enormous amounts of making things up and imagination and that, that uh, the very moment where they're going to, to sort of swerve away is, is the moment when it's most important for them to tell the truth. Um, so my rule was that it ha anything in the book either has to have happened to you, have happened to someone you know very well, <laughs> or someone you know very well has to have told you about it because they heard it from somebody else. But that sort of third hand is about as far away from yourself as, as you should ever actually go, which um, I don't know that any of my students ever took that advice, but, <laughs> but that's, that's my um, method. And it means, uh, it means having very strange relationships with other people um, sometimes. Uh, and in a novel, I, I feel very differently. I feel um, that life shows itself and that, and that a novel is not, not so much about um, uh, an account from inside an experience. It, it's, um, it's a reading of the terrain of life. And, okay, that terrain is read from, from a perspective. And for me, one of the really, really, really interesting things in the trilogy was realizing that that perspective um, could be essentially filleted of, of everything that, that was confusing about it, and especially filleted of its implication in the writing of the novel itself. You know, the novel did not have to know all these things, um, apparently because someone was supposedly narrating it or, or, or seeing these things. You, you know, the world can show itself perfectly well. And, you know, the, the, if you set yourself the ambition of, um, showing things that, that anyone would see if they happen to walk past. If that's, if that's 
your, your <laughs> technology, if that's all the technology you've got, which was essentially the challenge that I set myself pretty much with the trilogy, was like, okay, you know, anyone kind of sitting and, and listening or looking or, you know, would get exactly the same information as, as the book has. So there's no information that the book has that it's getting from some mysterious place um, about what happened in the past or what someone's thinking or because you, we don't know those things about others. And, you know, that, w that was, I suppose, as far as I could go with um, this reliance on in essentially the world to tell its own story. Um, and, and I guess in doing that, it became evident to me that there's there is actually a problem in, ri in writing and a problem with writers. Um, there is a massive, massive problem that's called imagination th that is a weird combination of egotism and making things up and, and fantasy and um, pornography even um, that, that is, well, I mean, it's, it, it can become the pornographic situation. Um, that, that once you are aware of that, um, your desire not <laughs> not to do that, um, and you know there are plenty of other writers who've made that same discovery, and and in the end, the retreat to the domain of the self is is the safest way of of um, yeah, kind of taking a vow, I suppose, not not to um, enter into that anymore. I find it really bold in a trilogy because I've read different. Um, point of view about what you were doing there. Sometimes people just say it's amazing, but they don't, they don't comment on that. And people are usually not that comfortable with speaking about what fiction is and why it works or not. They use huge words, but you don't feel like they really get it. And I don't necessarily think that I get it myself, but as a writer of fiction too, um, I don't know if you experience it yourself, but I would think that you have. When you're writing novels in a classical way, sometimes you feel that you have to, you know, you've written some pages that you like because the writing is good and you think that what you're saying here is really interesting. But then it's a novel, so you know that here you have to explain how did Tom get to Emma's or you have to put some dialogue so that people would not only see the people speaking but also identify what you've done as a sort of classical novel, not mm. some vanguard thing. And I think that was, uh, wha that's what I found the boldest in trilogy, is that you just, you just give up all this. You, you decide that you're doing what is obviously novels, but you're not gonna care about making all those, I don't know, connections between the conversation, what seems to interest you in that? It is showing people talking because that's what is interesting, the way people talk, the topics they decide to speak about, the way they do it. And even though Faye doesn't comment much on that, we can feel somehow her feelings about what's going on and her, the way she considers people. But you don't, you don't force yourself to do what could be considered they're artificial, at least from the atelier point of view, of the make-believe mm. of fiction, you know? Just the characterizing the characters, having characters that you, you know, and, and, and then, yeah, building a whole story about them. Is it because, maybe all I'm saying makes no sense? Uh, no, it completely does, and I mean that, the, the, you're describing modern literature, which is novels, written about novels, <laughs> essentially. Novels that are clones of novels and that don't ever actually necessarily, um, and that's how the novel is gonna become obsolete. Um. Yeah, this is it. Because when you, when you read books, and I don't think you have to be a novelist to feel like that, when you read books and you say, my favorite part of the book is, it's not the way that it all, it, it's all perfectly structured in a classical way of, you know, it's I like this, page when this character says something that I relate to, I like the, the sentences, or, and, and this is just the clock. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's trying to call you. <laughs> or it's my mom, it could be as well, never mind. But um, yeah, I really felt like you were getting to the core, and to me there was a sort of, that was really bold, but also somehow 
I could find a link between that and the boldness of what you did with the autobiographical writing. That's it. I have to tell something. And your tattoos used to say, you do not choose a subject as much as it chooses you. Like, you choose a subject because you need it. And that's what you said about the fact that, yeah, going to the truth of it. And, and, and so you just, yeah, you get rid of it all. And to me, that was a really bold point to make as a woman, to say my way of entering literature, of changing literature, would say enough with the manly constriction. Let's just get to the point of what is being said. And I don't know if you read that book by Lucy Ellman, um, Duck Sport. I haven't read it, no. I know about it. What she does in that is really, she just picture a 40 years old woman who's baking pies. So she's the woman that no one will see, you know, 40 years old woman baking pies. It, it's not a heroine at all. And it's all the monologue of what she's thinking, what she's doing this. And and somehow, that, that's, that's why I seen the link. It's, you just, you, what, with Faye, you choose a woman writer who's listening to other people. You just put it in the center of the fiction, saying this is fiction. Well, and the one thing I guess that I, that could not happen to someone reading the trilogy was that they could feel that they were in essentially a sort of shared pact of fantasy with the writer, where you know that you're going to read this book and basically you are going to press the pause button on being yourself <laughs> for as long as it takes you to read it. You're going to exist in a in a state of escape from yourself or of, of ultimate passivity. Um, and, th and that, that pact, that's a pact you make with the writer and that writer very much wants you, know, you to make that pact with them. And, and um, I guess that is what I, in the end, feel is so threatening to, um, to the novel as a form, but also to, to reading, readers, um, that, that a degree of uh, even just a degree of difficulty is, <laughs> you know, keeps you awake and stops you b being in that. Um, and yeah, what, what I was trying to do was something that completely removed that um, mutual basis in, in fantasy. And I mean, if you look at other art forms, particularly visual art, you see something that you know, not everybody might call it progress, but but the new, <laughs> there's always the edge. There are, you know, visual artists are always going to the edge and um, destroying what's behind them. And it's very, very difficult for literature to do that. Um, I mean, we're celebrating the centenary of Ulysses, and you think, well, that's funny. A hundred years ago, someone wrote a book that's far more radical than anything anyone would dare to write <laughs> today and would certainly not be published, probably. And you know, that idea that these, you know, these rules have been broken a million times, but writers make them again and follow them again, and perhaps readers want them to. And that, so there's something in literature that, that shares the terrain of living, and that's the wonderful thing about it. it but it, it also means that if you want to, um, I don't know, uh, reform it, um, you have to be careful about how you do that because it's, you reform the novel too much and, and it, no one's going to read it. You know, the, it's not like looking at a picture. It takes some time and effort to read a novel. So, so it's kind of an interesting question. Um, and yeah, I don't yeah, know whether I'll ever be doing it again. But um, <laughs> How far to the edge can one go in to experimentation and then still be readable in a way? I find I'm, I'm actually very happy that you just pronounced the word visual arts because I would think about that a lot. And I, I just read that interview to the New Yorker when you explained the choice you made for the last scene of Kudos when Faye bathes on a nudist beach and a man pees in a direction. And it, it she did it. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> And, and it sounds, to me at least, it, it sounds a lot like what a visual artist would say to explain his choice. Uh, well, I have the quotation, but maybe you just want to... No, no. Yeah? Uh, sure. Read that. <laughs> okay, wh what you say is, you say, this scene 
has its own reason. I see it as an acceptance of an element of not violence exactly, but separatedness, distinction, and this question of men and women, which, as I say, are fence all around it, and in the end, I sort of had to conclude that whatever women are, they are institutionally disadvantaged. I should not read that. I needed to find not just an image for it, but a sort of feeling about it, a feeling about what that victimhood, which I could understand, which is so much to do with the production of children, the nurture of children, and the defense of them, which is increasingly a shell world, and no one owns any of it. It's changing all the time. But this, as I say, elemental difference that is sex itself, it's not violent, but it looks like it. So the ending is really that. It's crude, I suppose, and primitive. And it's about genitals, bodies, none of which are mentioned very much in any of the other three books, but then suddenly there they are. You're still okay with that? Okay. <laughs> and it's reminded me vividly of Andy Warhol explaining that he'd close his eyes in front of a canvas and see blue, and so he'd paint this part blue, and then it's so green and painted green and so on. And also I thought about Francis Bacon, this story that I love so much. There's a portrait that he did of Henri I cannot pronounce this, Henrietta Moraes, which was his, one of his regular models, I think. And he did a portrait of her where he put a syringe on the portrait, that is, she's uh, lying on the bed, Francis Bacon style, and he just put a syringe somewhere that seems to nail her to the canvas. And Moraes say later in an interview that she was to become an addict later on, and that her interpretation of what happened is that Bacon knew it, that he knew that she would mm, fall into addiction before she herself knew it, and that's the reason why it was a sort of um, um, overvision something, uh, she, she, he put the syringe there. But Bacon was asked too, why did you put that? And he said, well, I just thought that a syringe was more subtle than a nail. I needed something to fix her on the canvas. And just syringe seemed more intelligent. So that, I've really thought about that a lot, about what you said about the conclusion of Kudush. Kudush, I don't know how to pronounce that either. <laughs> but do you, because it's hard when you write books, I think, to find a good metaphor to explain what you're doing, specifically on the technical ground. So would the visual arts offer you a good way to explain what you're doing? Do you think of your books as uh, art objects and that you make somehow outside of the question of grammar and even literature that you make as conceptual art object? Yeah, I mean, that is definitely my number one preoccupation right now and you know how can language be made to do those things um, I don't know it's very difficult um, you you can get as far as the, the the symbolism of objects the symbolic arrangement of reality um, but you, the fact is language exists in time you know unlike a painting a, a book is a thing that exists in time and and to um, to be able to, to get um, those arrangements, those effects that, that essentially are coming, even though they're being expressed in language, they're not linguistic, they're not coming from language, they're coming from a, a, a picture, <laughs> an image, a form. Um, I mean, you know, I definitely think that... Um, You know the recognition of form in in um, structures of living is, you know, that's maybe the the, the happiest place for language to be um, in terms of literary art. Um, you know, those writers who take the trouble to to actually sculpt <laughs> um, their text uh, in in that way by by closely observing um, the symbolism of how people live and, and behave and um, the forms that that behavior takes. Um, but I'm kind of interested in, in, yeah, kind of more than that and can language do more than that? Um, and, and I mean, the big issue with it is, is how, you, how you use memory. Um, because in the end, any kind of attempt to make a picture out of language is, um, going to involve <laughs> uh, 
uh, going over and over and over something. Um, and there's a few books that, that do that, and it's a very, very interesting thing to do. Um, and I sort of got in the spirit of that in lockdown and thought, actually, this is a this is a really, in, you know, I, I mean, a lot of writers thought, oh, this is interesting, lockdown, let's write a novel about lockdown. I definitely didn't think that. I thought um, maybe, I wonder if people are experiencing a feeling of um, return, of some return to other parts of life, um, a return to certain details of life, just to be the time stopping, things not going forward anymore. Um, that, uh, you know, I, I was interested to know whether whether um, that was in the universal consciousness as a, as a response to um, the pandemic. Um, but, you know, it would certainly seem to me that to do what you describe, um, you, you would need to find some way of dealing with, um, a better way of dealing with memory, I guess. That can be the end, <laughs> if you want. Yeah, I'm yeah, maybe that can be the end. I, I have other questions, but yeah, how about that? <laughs> Thank Let you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel.